And um, hi, everybody. Again, I'll say at the beginning of that. And um, welcome. Really excited about today's um, shiur, today's class, because um, uh, we're starting a new uh, series and um, uh, called Subversive Sequels. And I want to kind of give a little explanation of it just briefly and then jump right in because the first example that we'll look at will really uh, give us a good example of the kind of study that we're going to do over the next, I think, five sessions. Um, subversive sequels is an idea um, that I got from uh, another Bible scholar named Judy Klitzner, K-L-I-T-S-N-E-R. And she wrote a book by that name called Subversive Sequels, How Biblical Stories Mine and Undermine Each Other. And um, the, the, the claim of the book is simple, but her methodology is kind of a little more complex. The claim of the book is that there are pairs of biblical stories, that there are later stories which are literarily connected with earlier stories, but whose overarching messages undermine some problematic aspect of the earlier story. So you have a story. Today we're going to read the story of Noah and Jonah and talk about how <clears throat> the story of Jonah turns the story of Noah a little bit on its head, subverts it. And how as a sequel to, because the story of Jonah is later in the Bible, so it's the sequel as it were, it comes later. Um, how the later story, by being connected to the earlier story, and yet having things happen differently is a kind of, here's very fancy language, um, intra-testamental midrash, right? It's a, a interpretation of the Bible within the Bible itself, intra-testamental, meaning inside of the Bible itself. So in other words, we're going to look at the Bible as a commentary on the Bible. How the Hebrew Tanakh, um, through sequels, comments on earlier stories in the Hebrew Tanakh. Sounds good, right? Um, the methodology is going to be a little bit... Um, uh, more complicated, but I, I'm, I'm going to try to streamline it a little bit, and we'll see how it works in today's session. Then you'll give me some feedback at the end to let me know if it was if I, if I jumped all over the place. I, but I tried not to do that. Um, our method is going to be <clears throat> to look at the passages and to focus on um, both specific themes, things that happen in both stories. Like, for example, in Noah, there's a boat. And in Jonah, there's a boat. Now, it's not like every biblical story has a boat. So that's kind of remarkable that these two stories, and in both of them, there's a storm. And the protagonist is in the boat in a storm. So that's pretty remarkable, right? So there's a theme, some uh, aspect of the story that's shared. But more importantly than that, we're going to look at words, at the linguistic connections, at how the phrasing and the verbiage and the word choices of the later story really reinforce that thematic undermining and subversion of the earlier one. Any questions on any of that? Okay, cool. So let me do that. You can see that, right? And um, uh, let me ask you this. 
Do, do you see my Word document with my notes on it or just the Safari A page? Just the just Safari. The Safari A. Okay, that's good. Because I mean, not that you can't, my notes aren't exactly secretive or anything, but um, uh, but but you don't need to see them. Um, and, and I don't think they would be helpful, honestly. Um, okay. Let me just set up my screen here a little bit so I can see everybody. Good. Um, we're going to start with the story of Noah. And um, uh, Noah and Jonah uh, share many things. They share uh, names. They share themes. They share words. Um, in one of them, there's a character named Yonah, and other there is a Yonah, a dove. The name Jonah means dove. So right there, as soon as you read his name, if you're familiar with the the Bible at all, you will you will think, wait a minute, the you know there's a there's another dove, there's a Yonah in the story of Noah. Um, uh, they share also, uh, one of them, um, they share unusual place names. Um, and um, they both focus on the personal story of the prophet and almost pay no attention to their prophecy. Unlike Ezekiel. Ezekiel has chapters and chapters and chapters of prophecy. And only this much where the book tells you about Ezekiel himself. But the whole story of, the, of Noah, the whole story of Jonah is really their personal story. And this is kind of their one prophecy. They both have a single prophecy and it's very, very short for both of them. So they share a lot, a lot of things. They also... Um, in both stories, they fall into a deepish sleep, a self-induced, um, uh, here's how Judy Klistner says it. She says, they both have a self-induced oblivion. Mm -hmm. Noah by getting drunk and Jonah by falling asleep into a deep, deep sleep. Um, now, uh, uh, we're going to look at the similarities, but we're also going to highlight some of the differences. Okay, so here is Genesis chapter 6. Uh, the, um, and I just want to sort of set the, the tone for um, the Noah story. Um, I don't think I have to say to this group, but I want to say anyways, because I think it's important in, in our mindset, that... Uh, the story of Noah is not a little kid's story about, you know, by twosies, twosies, and animals going on the boat, right? It, like, somehow that became a thing that you make kids' toys out of, mm -hmm. right? But this is a, you know, this is a survival pod, and there is a massive apocalypse, and the whole of humanity is destroyed in, you know, drowned, the earth is destroyed. It's a, it's a genocide is what it is. And Noah is sort of like the begrudging hero of it. He's, he's complicated, although, as we'll see, the text talks about him in very glowing terms. All right, <clears throat> let's look. Vayar Adonai, God saw, and the Lord saw how intense, how great was human wickedness on earth, and how every plan devised by his heart, it says mind here, but the word in Hebrew is machshavot libo, the, the thoughts of his heart, the murmurings of his heart, rock Ra kol hayom. Only evil all the time. 
So it doesn't really get any much worse than that. Humanity is irredeemable. And, and the prophecy of Noah will be inevitable. And God, this is an, going to be an important word. Vayinachem Adonai. Anyone know what the Hebrew word nachem means? Nechama, it can mean to like give comfort. But in this uh, setting, it means to regret. Vayinachem Adonai ki asa et ha'adam. God regrets humanity. I'm sorry I ever made these guys. Everything about them is evil, ra, evil and wicked, and all they ever think of is horrible. <clears throat> and God regretted this, and his heart, in contrast to the lev of people, which is only evil all the time, God's heart was saddened. And God said, I will blot out from the earth the men who I have created <clears throat> from Adam, Ad Behema, humans together with beasts and creeping things and the birds of the sky. Of course, what's absent from this list that was present in creation that won't be destroyed? Why? Why no. Uh, and, um, well, it does not include plants, that's right, but it's, it's right in front of you. People. No. What's going to happen? The world is going to be flooded. Water, oceans. Fish. And fish, right, the fish, <laughs> right? So, right, all the creeping things, that's all the bugs, right? These are mentioned in creation. These are, this is the undoing of creation here. God regrets creating the world and he's going to wipe the whole darn thing out. Um, and except for fish, obviously, who, you know, you can't ruin by raining on them. For again, we learn, Nichamti ki asitin. I regret that I made them. But Noah finds favor with God. That's pretty remarkable, isn't it? Just right there. Noah is unique i have a question about why the animals the beasts and creeping things and birds are included does the only evil or the only bad one we've met so far i yes. think right. is the snake or the only um, questionable one yeah it's a bit that's a big problem um it's uh, the the totality of the destruction it's other than Noah and what's on the boat, everything. I think that is the sort of, is, is the point. It's going to be total. And, you know, um, like there's, there's um, swords and there's scalpels, right? This is not a scalpel operation. This is a sword operation. God is coming in and, you know, boom, right? Something and and you will get caught up. So I don't know if it's that the, you know, the birds and the, and the bees, because he's, you know, are, are all so bad, but um, it, it does seem like they are included. Except that he saves some of them. Right, so. except that he's going to save, um, animals and presumably they are just examples of animals they're not like you know like noah was um somehow nicer or better animals than the others but maybe it doesn't say that so i think that's sort of utilitarian and he's going to save to repopulate the animals but noah is going to repopulate because he's somehow different right we're going to start all over it's the new adam and then it it's going to uh, give us this is the story of noah and again it's going to say Noah was righteous. Tamim haya bedorotav. He was blameless in his generation or in his age. Um, 
let's jump ahead here for a second to what Rashi says and his comment on that verse, Bedorotav, in his generations, in his age. And Rashi, like he almost always does in these situations, is going to cite earlier rabbinic midrash and earlier commentary. So he's going to say, our rabbis explain. He's, he's talking about something that's already known and written, but he's concentrating it here in loco, you know, where it's supposed to be. Um, explain that this is to his credit, right? This is a compliment. He was righteous even in his generation, right? This was the worst people ever. These are all wicked, evil people. And yet somehow Noah was able to be righteous. It follows that if he had lived in a generation of righteous people, he would have been even more righteous owing to, you know, the force of goodness all around him. So in other words, they're saying, Noah was a really righteous guy, so much even the, even though he grew up in this terrible, horrible, violent place, and amongst people who were only terrible, sinful, violent people, uh, he was good. So imagine if he had grown up, you know, in Niceville, then, it, you know, he would have been even more remarkably good. Others, however, say it is to his discredit. You know, this, the, this comment on Noah, maybe the, um, the goodness of Noah is a qualified goodness, but, we, you know, he's still good. But he was good in comparison to the other people who were around. Had he lived in the generation of Abraham, he would have, like, been a nobody. His goodness would have been, you know, a third tier. Right? He's only good in comparison. We're going to come back to that idea. Um, uh, look at this passage, though, from Genesis 5.29. It's, it's the earlier chapter. It's, the pre it's, it's before the Noah story, but it tell, it's when Noah's birth is told of by his father Lamech, who comes in the earlier genealogy. And they named him Noach. Why did they name him Noach? <laughs> this one comfort. will nacham, will comfort us. Same word that's used for God's regret. This one will relieve us, will comfort us from Ma'asenu, from our own deeds and what we have done with the earth and the curse and our, the curse which we have. In other words, the hope of a generation was placed in Noah. He's the last good hope of humanity, which is why he's placed on the ark. This is, the, this is a, a Superman story. He's Superman, right? I mean, he's, he's placed in the ark in order to, you know, save goodness from the, in, the coming destruction and genocide of the planet. Could I ask a question about, yes, about this passage? Um, because, oops, disappeared. Um, hmm. because, I'll get it back, go ahead. Yeah, because it talks literally about the... Um, the work and the toil of our hands. Um, and so it, you know, on the surface of it, um, at least reading from the English, it just sounds like, uh, you know, we're gonna be able to put our feet up and, uh, 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 you know, not have to plant and toil and dig and so on. Um, so I'm just asking, I guess, from maybe from the Hebrew or something, there's there's a way of um, seeing this passage in in a deeper way than than I had understood it. Um, the the passage is this pasuk, right? Yenachamenu itzavon, right? May comfort us. Um, uh, 
the toil of our hands. See, I read that as the... Um, uh, Atsuv is sad. Right, look up here. Um, uh, God regrets, ki nichamti, and um, um, vayit atsev el, el libo, itzavon, yit atsev, God's heart is saddened. Right? The, it's, and by the way, it's just a few sentences before this chapter. It's a, it's a different piece literarily because, it, you know, the, the story begins with, you know, here was Noah. But, and the previous one is attached to the previous genealogy. But they come right next to each other. And um, uh, this one will save us. When he was born, the world, his parents felt the world is ruined. And this one will save us from the sadness and the deep curse that's befallen humanity. But of course, it doesn't work. I mean, I mean, it does work and it doesn't work. You know, like he's, he is born. He will be saved. He, he will be the future of humanity, but um, not before the inevitable and unavoidable destruction comes. It's going to happen. Um, um, just, okay, I want to return to the text. Um, and finish the Noah story a bit, right? Noah uh, had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Yafet. The earth became corrupt. Vatimale Haaretz Hamas. And the world was filled with lawlessness or violence. Uh, it's not clear exactly what the word Hamas means, um, but it's an important word here, and it will appear in the Jonah story. And it's not that common a word. And it means profound violence, right? I mean, like cruelty, deep, dyed-in-the-wool kind of badness. Hine nishchata ki hishchit. Everything is corrupted and fouled and really, really bad and lawless. And then he tells Noah, uh, make the ark of gopher wood, make the ark with compartments, cover it outside with pitch, and this is how you shall make it. Make an opening for the daylight. Uh, right, I'm not really interested in the ark at, in, in this, at this point. Um, put the entrance of the ark in the side. Um, for, for my part, I will bring the flood, waters up from the earth to destroy all flesh under the sky in which there is a breath of life. Everything on earth shall perish. It is a, the totality and the inevitability of it. But I will establish my covenant with you. And we'll see here that the language, the way he, this language talks about Noah and his wife and his children is going to come back and be slightly changed at the end of the story. And it's going to be important. Um, uh, you shall enter the ark with your sons your wife and your son's wives. You, your sons, your wife and your son's wives. Right? It could have said, you and your wife and your sons and their wives. It doesn't say that. It says, you and your sons, your wife and their wives. Um, and you shall take two of every kind of thing from the birds and the cattle, every kind of creeping thing too you shall take. For your part, take of everything that is eaten and stored away to serve as food for you and for them. And Noah did as God told him to do. What is Noah's response? He does it. Yes. He just goes and builds the ark. Then the Lord said to Noah, go into the ark. This is a chapter later after the ark is built. It must have taken some time to build it. Um, with all your household, for you alone have I found righteous before me in this generation. And once again, Noah did just as God commanded him.
Now, as a sidebar, as a sidebar, Klitzner points out a couple of things about um, the comparison of Noah to Abraham. Um, um, and it, it is very interesting because um, we're talking about um, role models. It, what kind of role model is Noah? He's, he's not that good a role model. He's, he's praised as being unique in his generation. But when um, the Midrash asks, why is God's covenant made with Abraham and not Noah? Noah's the new Adam. Why not start the covenant with humanity and the big covenant that he gives to Abraham? Why not start that with Noah? And the uh, Midrash... I'm sorry. No, no. What was that? Well, you asked the question, why, 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 doesn't, why isn't the covenant with Noah? Because Noah really wasn't that great. Um, he was better than most. Um, mm -hmm. He didn't ask to save his family. He, didn't, he wasn't humble before God at all. He just... Um, not only does he not ask to save his own family, he doesn't ask to save anyone. He completely accepts that everyone he knows on earth will be killed without a peep. He just does it. In that sense, as a prophet, he's very good. God says, do it. He does it. What does Abraham do when God's going to destroy Sodom and Amorah? Just one little, two little, you know, sister cities. Not the whole world, just one little place, which has also descended into violence and horribleness. What does Abraham do? He, he argues with God. Argues. Right. Maybe there's, and maybe there's, maybe Ulai, 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 says Abraham. Which, by the way, is something Jonah is going to say. He asks, maybe. That's a, that's a much bolder response to God. Come on, God. He doesn't even say there are ten righteous people. He just says, maybe. Right? I mean, he's putting it all on the line on a maybe. Um, uh, uh, the, the ark is built of atse gopher. Gopher wood. I'd say gopher. What is Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed with? Gofrit, with brimstone. Gofrit and gopher. One of them uses the gopher, you know, is like the protector, and one of them, the gopher, is the raining down upon the people, the destroyer. Um, Klitzner has a whole uh, sidebar. Both of them use the word to rain down upon. Matar, himtir. God is flooding in both cases, but in one of them, Abraham's in and arguing and trying to save people. And in the other one, Noah locks himself away and watches quietly while everyone else is destroyed. Strong comparison. And of course, that leads to this terrible response. What does Noah do when he comes out of the ark? This is, this is the real tragedy of Noah. Um, uh, here we see God says to him, uh, I'll establish my covenant with you. Um, oh, no, I'm sorry. Um, now in chapter 8, the flood has come and gone. By the way, um, do you know how long it was? How long? Were they on the ark? 40 E. Right. So the 40 rain. 40 something. So. Right. So the rain comes for 40 days. Nonstop deluge rain for 40 days. Which, let's just say, is a very, 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 very problematic aspect of the story since there has been zero water added to the Earth's atmosphere since the creation of the Earth. Where the heck did all that water come from? If there's no sun and there's no, you know, condensation cycle and all the water cycle, right? I mean, where's that water coming from? All right, that's just, you know, 
<laughs> That's just pesky little Hillel over here thinking. Geologists like, have an answer to that. It either came by landing as meteorites hit the earth, or another part of it came from volcanic eruptions. Because when you have gases coming out of a volcano, the major gas is steam and it rises, cools, condenses, and comes back on the earth. Now, I'm not saying that if that happened at the same time as this story, because there's okay. about 4 billion years that are out of place. But. Um, uh, okay, that go ahead. Said that would take a really long time, but okay, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm willing to accept that there is a possibility. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't mean to ruin your story. No, no, but. That's, quite, that's quite all right. Um, if I can be pedantic, you can be too, right? I mean, like, come on, that's the whole point of being pedantic is to invite other it's fun. And everything happens in 40s, anyhow. Right. Well, um, we're going to see 40 days is a feature of the Jonah story, but in a very different way. Here, 40 days is the duration of the des destroying presence of God. By the way, they are then on the ark for another year. If you read the description carefully, it only rains for 40 days. But they are on the ark for over a year. Now, like, try to get into the mindset, into the head of Noah. Right? Week one, okay, you know, maybe, like, everything's, you know, we got it covered. The animals are all right. and We're all right. And I'm here and my family's here. But then the truth starts to sink in of what has just happened. And there's, you know, the ark is pretty dark and pretty horrible place where they are locked away for a year to think about what has happened. Okay, now they come out of the ark. God says, come out of the ark together with your wife, aha, and your sons and your sons' wives. See how the order is different here? Before they go in, when they go in in the flood, the suggestion is, the Midrash is, that they will be separated. No sexual congress on the ark. You and your sons, your wife and your son's wives. When you come out of the ark, what will you have to do? Just like Adam and Chava, you will have to repopulate the earth. So you come out of the ark together with your wife and your sons and your sons' wives, them together with their wives, so that we can, you know, repopulate the earth. Bring out with you every living thing, all of the flesh that is with you, birds, animals, everything that creeps, and let them swarm and peru uruvu ala aretz, be fruitful and multiply on earth, just like it was said to Adam in the garden. I mean, outside the garden. Vayetse noah hubanav. And Noah came out together with his sons, his wife, and his son's wives. Did he change it? The, the he changes the order back again, right? It's very confusing. Um, so, um, uh, the, the one way of thinking about that, Cindy, is God wants them to come out and repopulate. But they don't or there, there, something isn't right. Normal human relations don't restart. And then we're told, Noah, Ish Adama, the earth man, a man of the ground. What does he do? I mean, this is, this is you know, this is, a, a, this, is psych, this, this is like deranged, this is psychotic. He, he needs food, he needs to plant. He's, he's, he's a tiller of the soil, he's an agriculturist. And the very first thing that he plants is grapes. That is not a smart move. I mean, it takes a long time to grow grapes and you can't live on it. But he, he's, he does it because he wants wine. He plants grapes, he drank wine, and he gets drunk and naked. Right? What's he doing? I mean, he's drowning himself. He has, he has, maybe he thinks, I should have spoken up. 
holy cow, everyone I know is dead. Grief, anger, guilt, failure. This is how I love this line that uh, uh, here in the middle that uh, Klitzner says, though irreproachable as an individual, we're told he was pure, he was perfect, he's God's chosen. Noah, as a leader, was a tragic failure. If he had acted more like Abraham, Noah might have gone on record as a righteous man, not only in his age, but for all times. And her claim is Noah uh, suffers um, the guilt of someone who didn't do something when they could have done something to save someone. And it is his lasting failure. And he drowns himself in an effort to share the fate of the people who he allowed to drown. Okay, now I want to shift to Jonah. Uh, Jonah's a longer story, um, but nonetheless, um, uh, Jonah inverts um, Noah. Not only is God different in this story, as we will see, but the prophet is also different. Um, God is different in that this is not inevitable. Um, it, it, this is not uh, going to happen for sure. And the prophet is also different. Because even though he's told to do something, he does not do it. He's told, go up, and instead he goes down. Okay. Um uh, and he had the word cried through Nineveh. Um, this is the, uh, the story of the end of, well, do I want to start here? Hold on a second. Ah, okay. Um, how does the, the, the main way that this story is different is the people are saved. In the Noah story, everyone's destroyed. Uh, humanity is irredeemable. But in this story, the king of Nineveh says, by decree of the king, no man or beast, here too, the animals are participating in the event, um, shall taste anything. They all fast. Humans and the beasts, and cover with sackcloth, man and beast. Let everyone turn back from his evil ways. Mi darko hara'a, his evil ways. Umin hechamas, and from the cruelty and violence. Asher bekapehem, of which they are guilty. So the, the, they are also filled with hamas and ra'a. But unlike in the Noah story, they repent, and the king does it, and um, who knows but that God may turn and relent. Again there, that mi yodea, ulai, maybe God will, the nicham Elohim, that God will nechama, change God's mind. Only here, the nicham will not be that he created human beings and wants to wipe them out, the nechama, the regret, the change of mind will be, I want to destroy them, but they repented, so I won't destroy them. Vayar Elohim et ma'asehem, the work of their hands. Vayinachem Elohim, and God regrets or renounces here, it's not regret, Al hara'a asher diber lasot. God um, regret, renounces the punishment he had planned and he does not carry it out. Velo asa. In contrast to Noah, who is the Cain asa, here we have velo asa. The prophecy, in other words, mm -hmm. works and God changes God's mind and the people are saved. 
Now, um, it doesn't start out that way, right? Um, but um, here is the whole of the prophecy of Jonah. He made his way into the city, the distance of one day's walk. Nineveh is a city that's three days wide. So if you walk into the city one day's travel, you're in the middle of the city. So Jonah goes to the very center of the city. And he says his uh, prophecy is precisely five words. Od arba'im yom veninveh nehepachet. In 40 days, Nineveh will be overthrown or overturned, up, upset. That's it. That's the whole prophecy right there. Unbelievable. And of course, it works. No arguing, no negotiating with God. No, what if there's 40? Well, what if there's 30? Well, what if there's only 20? What if there's only 10? Jonah delivers the prophecy and, and it works. The people hear it. The king hears it. He declares everybody repent. Everybody does repent and it works. Now, um, uh, again, they, the, uh, both prophets have this post-prophecy trauma, right? What is the, what's the impact of the prophecy? In Noah's, the impact of the prophecy is he, he remains drunk, um, naked, and he basically never talks to God ever again. In Jonah, the prophecy works, and Jonah says, take my life. I would rather die than live. To which God says, get up. <laughs> I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> but God says, um, you, you, don't you care? You, you, you don't care about the people? You care more about this one plant than you do about the people? Uh, Jonah wants to die afterwards. But he's redeemed. He comes back. God goes to him and says, um, come on, get back up. And here's how Klitschner says it. It's really, I, 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 I want to read a little bit from her. Um, uh, um, the, the book of Jonah has begun to revise the story of Noah, presenting a more compassionate attitude by God towards the world, combined with a less charitable perspective on the prophet. The result is Jonah's desperate attempt to avoid the divine charge as he seeks to escape from God in any way possible. But the book recasts the story of Noah in another way by taking a new look at the emotional toll exacted on the prophet as a result of his refusal to help humanity. I, until I read her book, I'd never really thought about that in that way, that both Jonah and Noah experienced this, this trauma. And um, uh, uh, she goes back and reviews the, the, the process through which Jonah goes. We're told a lot more about Jonah's internal um, conversation. And, and we'll just look at a couple more passages um, uh, here, and then uh, we'll open it up to more conversation. Um, the passage where um, uh, Jonah is on the ship. God gives all these opportunities for Jonah to learn, to grow, to become more flexible, to not just accept reality. Jonah very often says, I know, ani yadati. I know. He's certain. He has 
the certainty of Noah almost, the inevitability of Noah. He knows it's going to happen. But in the encounter, but then God sends um, messengers, the storm, the fish, the people on the boat, the plant in the desert, the king, right? There's all these characters who come into Jonah's path who show him that inevitability is not the mission of the prophet. It's not to deliver the message of inevitable genocide and there is no repentance and nothing you can do about it. We're not wicked from our birth. We can change and grow. God wants to renounce the decree, not regret the creation. And you see here, she, uh, Klitschner highlights, there's nine or 10 different places in their story with the people on the boat where they ask him questions. Malika, why are you going to sleep? Maybe you could pray. Um, who is responsible for this? What do you do? Where are you from? Who is your God? What are the people you're from? What is your country and where are you going? The future is unknown. Who we are and what we can be is wide open. Um, and they hesitate to throw him over. They recognize him. They want to help him. It, they try to steer towards the, towards the shore. In all of it, human agency is so much more active. And it's only when they can't do it as last resort that they throw him over. And even then, they feared God greatly and offered sacrifices and made vows. They regretted that they had to send him over. Rather than Noah, who, you know, shuts himself in the boat and doesn't give two hoots about the people outside of the boat. Who are drowning. Um, uh, is human destiny fixed? Is our nature predetermined? If you read the Noah story, our nature is determined. We, we're irredeemable. We're violent, cruel, wicked from birth and only have destructive intention. And it is only because God just doesn't wipe us out again that we're still here. But if you read Jonah, um, human nature is not fixed. An irredeemable man, seemingly a guy who isn't that great, who's trying to run away, who does everything wrong, can still help along the way for humanity to be redeemed, to save us and all of the animals. And all of the similarities between the story make us realize the latter story is trying to tell us something about the earlier story. Not only is God different, not only does God no longer want to destroy us, God regretted. It's, the, it's one of the great lessons of Noah, is that God can change God's mind. But the lesson of Jonah is that we can change our ways, become better, and we can change God's mind. We're empowered. Our nature and our destiny are not fixed, irredeemable, or inevitable. They are in our own hands. If only we will ask questions and not lock into that um, certainty and inevitability mindset. Ask like Avraham, Ulai, maybe. Ask like the people on the boat, what, why, when, where are you going? 
If you have questions, the future is open and our nature is redeemable. All right. Your questions, your comments, reactions, responses. Sometimes I think we need a flood today. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, it is, it's a very appealing, uh, Marsh, it's a very appealing um, uh, 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 dynamic, I think, in, in human psychology to throw it all out and start from scratch. Right. You know, you, you open up the junk drawer and you just want to dump it all out and start with an empty drawer. Right. We, we do it in little ways and we do it in big ways. Right. Eh, I'm just going to wipe that guy out of my life. Forget it. Forget that friend. I, I'm, ne I'm never talking to him again. Right. It's that certainty. We, we, we long. We do. It's a part of us. We crave certainty. And um, uh, it, it rarely serves us too well, honestly. I think that's part of this lesson. And um, I sometimes think about that, you know, like uh, get rid of all your stuff and just have only a few things. But I, I try to let those things pass because I think they are, they're, they're very impulsive and they're very, they, they, coll they're, they collapse possibilities. So, 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 so and, and, and don't we believe that we want to turn people from their wicked ways, Marcia, and not, you know, kill them? God wants us to be redeemed. He wants the, the KKK clan members to take their hood off and open their eyes and see, oh, my God, these people are my cousins and my brothers. Yeah, but people it, are not doing that. I know. I know. <laughs> They're filled with Hamas and hatred. Interesting yes. that Hamas is. Uh, uh, yeah, Margaret, that is interesting, and, and I wonder, and I wonder what it resonates for people in in Israel. Yeah. It does. It does not resonate good, and um, I believe their name, however, comes. It's I believe it's an acronym. Of right. I believe it's an acronym in you know Hatman Samach kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, you know, if your acronym spelled. Um, kill, you know, you would probably change your acronym. <laughs> so, Rabbi, yes. Rabbi, yes, sir. So, so, so I'm, I, I'm, I'm all in favor of Jonah, and I think he's he's the champion of this story. But, but I think I think Noah gets a, is coming off a little bad in this thing. I mean, he, this guy's been on this this boat for over a year. He hadn't he hadn't had anything to drink. He hadn't had a woman. He's, I mean, he may not be a young man. He may be a couple of hundred years old, but whatever it is, he's not had any pleasures. And I, and I think I can understand when I got off that boat, I would probably pet grapes instead of potatoes too. <laughs> I, um, it, it's very human, isn't it? It is. It's very human. And, um, um, I'm not the first to observe that um, the human history from the beginning of history is filled with a, the human effort to alter our reality and change our mind by eating and drinking weird stuff. <laughs> just think different. <laughs> it's, it's literally as old as we are. As old as our consciousness is, is an effort to alter it. <laughs> I mean, that, that is a defining part of human nature. And um, that's why we roll down the hill and spin around in circles and get ourselves all dizzy, right? It's not just drinking, um, <laughs> but, it, it's, it's, but, but it is an effort. We, we have this thing, I, you know, I don't know what you would call it. Maybe it's good. And I think what you're pointing out is what I would call the incredible importance of pleasure and play. These are not um luxuries pleasure is essential component of being a compassionate human people who are denied pleasure um become cruel so um and and when they become cruel also become um tormented by their own cruelty 
because um, perpetrators suffer from being perpetrators, a terrible suffering. Um, so uh, Noah was kind of like a, you know, he was a appeaser. He went along. He was an accommodator. And right. as a result, he has that guilt. Um, I do think that is also he endured genocide. He is the lone survivor. He has survived. Um, he, through no real, he can't really tell through any virtue of his own. What did he do? He doesn't know what he did to be the one who lived. Um, and everyone he ever knew is dead. And I mean, talk about, you know, trauma. Gee, I think I'd hit the bottle pretty hard too. <laughs> yeah. Let's say years worth of animal poop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. And you know that his sons weren't like just volunteering to help clean up the house. <laughs> <coughs> <laughs> um, yeah, other comments? I think there have been books written, like the Apocalypse Now, or On the Road Where the World is Destroyed and There's Just a Couple People Left. And I right. can't, uh, I think it was On the Road. Which um, is a yeah, yeah the, the Road. I think it's called The Road. The Road? Yeah. Where the father and the son are the only ones left. Yeah. And it, uh, it's so sad. It's terrible. It's scary. It, um, yeah, it is. It is scary. I, um, I, I love those things. They have a very wonderful appeal as entertainment, right? I think. Um, and um, they tap into something. Um, but, uh, but, you know, I know it's fantasy. Like, and if it's not fantasy, well, it, this is not, you know... No, thank you. Right. I'm, I'm not interested. Um, that's there's no that's not a wouldn't it be great if we all just, you know, went back to living on the edge and, you know, each one on their own. And no, it would not be great. It would be horrible <laughs> right away. It would be immediately bad. And um, and most people would suffer greatly. Um, uh, the the yeah, the thin veneer is, is an important veneer. Yeah, good. Others. The um, our next uh, the um, uh, again the the book is uh, did, did this work okay? This kind of format. Yeah. Yeah, you can follow along with the text. Good. Um, the book, as I said, um, all along is required or anything, um, and I'm trying to distill a lot of what she says into each of our lessons, um, but I really do recommend the book. It's very, very helpful. Uh, I mean, it's very, very enjoyable. And, um, uh, but you don't need it for our class. The next chapter, we're gonna follow her chapters. Um, and the next chapter is on the two story, two of the stories in, um, uh, uh, one story in Genesis, one story in Exodus. The Genesis story is the Tower of Babel story. And uh, the Exodus story is this, the midwives, the two midwives who uh, defy <laughs> Pharaoh's order and don't kill the Israelite boys. The midwives, yeah. Yes, Barbara, or are you I, just saying? Oh, yeah. No, I'm waving shalom to everybody, but I also wanted to just say, you said did that work for me. First of all, I really enjoyed it and I learned some stuff and you made me think a lot. I right. like the whole concept of looking at the stories like this. I do want to say something, and I don't know, and I want to say it carefully because I really love today. I do love when I hear Margaret and Suzanne and Mickey and Marsha. I can't, I can't say everybody, Barbara. I want to know what they're thinking, like the Socratic method, too, because you make some remarkable statements. And sometimes I want to hear... I don't know what, what I'm trying to say, Rabbi, and I know there's a limited amount of time. Margaret, you're a psychologist. Will you help me here? But no, I, 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 I get it, and I am not insulted. You don't have to be careful at all. Thanks. Um, I, I, um, I'm trying to get a lot in, right? And, <laughs> oh, I, um, and you um, do, I, and you do, and you do. No, no I, I appreciate that. I really, I am not insulted. I, I, I really do value the feedback. I don't just okay. say I value it. I really do value it. I um, do. 
believe you do. Right. It may, by the way, it makes it a lot. It makes life a lot easier if you yeah. really value good feedback. Um, yeah. uh, I, I will try to uh, not try to grab as much out of the jar so that I can get more out of the jar. Right? You know what I mean? So I, I, I'll try yeah. to do that. It's it, it's hard with this stuff because they are. She's so much <laughs> doing so much, but I'm going to do it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna do okay. It. And you know, um, I like I, the conversation too. I want to hear. The, 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 it's all good. I mean, sometimes just the people, I, I don't get to hear how these people think very much. So I'd love well, to. It, to me, this, it's, I've never things presented like this. So it's more a learning lecture type subject lecture. than it is discussion of opinion or what. I, I mean, I agree with, with the rabbi that it, Maybe, yeah, I, no, I mean, I want it to be a, a, a lot of text. I love, I love Rabbi seeing the Hebrew and the English together too. That, that's helpful for me. Um, maybe if uh, those of us, if we feel like we have something to say that we can use the chat more so the rabbi won't feel like, well, um, am I squelching somebody? Right. Or, uh, yes, that, that's true. And, you know, raise a hand, interrupt, right? I, I, I don't mind being interrupted with questions and that. And, and, and if we don't get to everything, that's also fine. So um, uh, I, I don't mind being interrupted. Yeah. Would it make sense to take two weeks for, yeah. uh, for, uh, for a um, chapter? Or is that... No, no, much. no, I, I, it, it's, and I'm going it, to, it's going to be a yin yang thing. It's going to be a little of each and it's going to be less and more yang the next week than it was this week. So I, I think uh, each chapter a week is good and I'm going to try to not grab as much. It's okay. You don't have to teach everything every time. Yeah. Uh, Cindy, Mickey, Ella. Maybe this topic doesn't allow, it's like Suzanne said, doesn't allow for the ex as much exchange of ideas as maybe a lot of us are used to in the past because some of us have studied before and studied together before and are used to that, that methodology of sharing. So perhaps the next module that we do, hoping that you will do another, would be one that maybe wrestles with lessons of the Bible. You know, here, here you're putting forth this lesson, that lesson, one next to the other, but allowing us, you know, maybe sharing a, a small text ahead of time. Right. Everybody reading the text and then coming to the group so that we can wrestle with the text, but if for a different topic, a different module. Uh, Beautiful. Excellent. Yeah. I like that I, idea. Um, um, that, that's excellent. Thank you, Cindy. And um, I am planning to continue Thursday teachings uh, past this, these, this module for sure. Um, and uh, I have something already in mind that is a shorter text and more grapple. So yeah, cool. Um, and look, if after three or four weeks, we all are like, Ugh, I, this Klitzner stuff is great, but not here. Like, okay, so we'll jump to the other one quicker. Like, I'm, I really am flexible. I, um, I'm not um, Ulai, right? I'm not Aniyadati. I don't. I'm not Noah. I'm more Jonah than Noah. <laughs> yeah, good, uh, Mickey. Well, we can't hear you. No, we can't hear you still. All right, Ella, what were you going to say? Make so, you I guess we um, like to hear to... ourselves talk. <laughs> Hello. I, was I, was go I was going to suggest that maybe for this module, we could extend it possibly to an hour and a half rather than an hour. Mm -hmm. And then also, it, this just came to mind, and I haven't heard the words in a long time, but Mickey McCats once had a song that said, I'm a Shlemiel of fortune, and I thought of Noah. Uh, when we were talking, you know. I'm a Shlemiel of fortune. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you don't want to be that. <laughs> well, I, I thought of him as, as that. Yeah. Yeah. 
Bye-bye. Yes, well, I was just going to say an hour and a half might help uh, us I'm, with this module. Yeah, I, uh, I'm, I'm happy to stay an hour and a half and, and do more. And I'm also, if people want to stay but can't stay, like you can walk out in the middle. That It really is okay. Um, all that, it's, it's very loose and easy going. Yes, ma'am. I'm just thinking back to two of the schools I've been to and their methods of teaching. And that was as an undergraduate, when I began looking at art from before caves <laughs> until yesterday, there was, and I talked for 13 years here and another 20 in Washington, I always felt this need to get through the material as though the kids were not able to go find the book and spend more time with it themselves. But when I went, when I was in school in Paris, the French had this wonderful <laughs> system for those of us who didn't understand French perfectly at that point. They had a system of what they called les répétitions you simply went to the lecture, the grand lecture in the 18th century lecture hall, which held 500 students. And then it was broken down into small groups, which is really what Wellesley College did. There was a lecture and then you had a special person with whom you met to discuss what you had heard in the lecture. And I think, I think some of us, I think most people are here because we are searching for ways to relate this ancient and venerable past to today, to us, to our world, our problems. And I don't know how you do that. Staying a little longer is one thing, but which may not fit people's lunch hours and et cetera. Um, that's one way to just do the lecture one week and the next week have at it mm -hmm. from all these different directions. And it's worth trying and seeing what might work, I think. All right. I, I do yeah. think group one gets interested in and used to hearing the other people. You know, you learn to respect what they're what they're saying. Yeah. So, uh, just thoughts. And I never did figure out how to get it all in. <laughs> I was always the last one. That there was a terrible snowstorm in Birmingham, and UAV shut down, and I had to finish it. And by the time I opened the door, the snow was halfway up. <laughs> the doorway <laughs> walk from market knows where I live and I had to walk from UAB home in the snow with you know coats that was not ample so you can get yourself into trouble <laughs> sticking within the deadlines <clears throat> Mickey, well, it did sounds want, like... Mickey did you want to say something what I wanted to say is, I think this author is absolutely brilliant. I've never had an approach like this before where you compare to and pick out those that, that meshed and those that didn't and why they didn't. And I think today, of course I say this every week, has been one of the best. <laughs> thank you. You're welcome, thank you, thank you. I am. Um, uh, I, I had an a education professor who once said, um, you can either cover material 